Today is uh, recognized as Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, January 22nd, 1973 was the day that the Supreme Court handed down the decision we call Roe v. Wade. It was a decision that uh, legalized abortion in our, in our nation. And uh, there's a lot of discussion. It's a big political issue and has been now for 39 years and will be as long as, uh, as, long as you know, that exists. But uh, I believe that when that happened, it was just another step downward in the downward spiral of moral anarchy that we, that we live in. Um, so uh, today is uh, every year we recognize that day. And I want to say this. Uh, there are two sides to that debate, and it seems that the people on either side are very passionate about what they feel, pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, I want to say this, and I think you all know this, and, and if you don't, you ought, you ought to know this, that I am pro-life, 100%. Uh, the Church of God, that we are, they have stated their position as being pro-life. Uh, and there are reasons for that. And I know there's a lot of debate and discussion, and I don't, you know, if somebody disagrees with that, I don't look down my nose at them, I don't judge people, but it's not so much of a political thing, it's what God says. It's what God says. I've, I found out uh, that life is a very, is a very precious thing. When, when that decision was made, that was back in 1973, and I was just a, a not quite uh, 20 years old then, okay? So I really didn't have a whole great, and I sure didn't know the Lord, okay? I wasn't saved. And uh, I sure didn't know the Lord. And I, uh, when that came down, I just kind of shrugged my shoulders and said, well, hey, it makes things easy, you know. Uh, you know, one thing I found out, and again, I'm not saying this to, you know, diss anybody, but uh, when we talk about pro-life and, and pro-choice, uh, you know what, and I don't want to, please don't get offended at me, Satan is pro-choice. Not just in the area of, you know, human reproduction. But in everything. Now, now, God designed us and gave us a free will that we could make decisions, moral decisions. And God would like us to make our decisions according to what his word says. But he gives us the option. And I guarantee you, Satan will give you another option than what God's word says. That's what he did in the garden with Eve. He gave her a choice. He was pro-choice. Uh, in this time that we live in, and, and, and for myself, and we're going to look at God's Word here in a minute, I find this issue to me to be a defining issue. When I walk to the polling place to vote, I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican, white, black, rich, poor, I don't care where they're coming from. The first question I would ask them is, how do you feel? Are you... 100% pro-choice. Uh, I'm sorry, pro-life. <laughs> pro-life. We'll cut that part off. <laughs> Slip. Pro-life. Some may say, well, yeah, and, and I've, we've heard all the arguments, and some, some, some may disagree with me, and that's fine. But I, this morning I want to look at God's Word and see what His Word says about life. As I was saying before, when I was younger and this first came out, I didn't really think about it. I figured, well, okay, that's just, you know, that'll work. But as I grew older, and especially after I got to know the Lord Jesus Christ, I found something out that life is very precious. Human life is extremely precious. This is called the sanctity of life. That word sanctity means set apart, holy. It's where we get our word sanctification or saint. Life is a holy thing given by God. And I was thinking that, as I've, I've read a little bit about, you know, I always wondered, you know, the, the argument is, when does life begin inside the mother's womb? 
I've, I've done some reading on this, and I'm convinced beyond any, any doubt at all that at the moment of conception, at the moment when that little sperm swims up and penetrates that egg, and, and all of a sudden things start to happen, a protein shield forms around that egg to protect it from any other intruders. And as soon as that, that match is made, as soon as that connection is made, the genetics of that person is set at that moment. It's gender, it's eye color, it's hair color, it's skin color. It's all the things that are encoded in its, in its gene, uh, genetics is, is set right at that minute. It might not be able to think. It's just one little cell and it separates into two cells and four cells and eight cells and 16 cells and, and starts to double and starts to grow and starts to become a human being. But at that earliest point, it can't think, it can't express itself, but that's a person. A person ordained by God. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. We might call them accidents. But every human being that is born is known by God and ordained by God, and we have a purpose by God. That being that's formed in the mother's womb at the very beginning, at, 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 at the start of life, at conception, uh, an eternal soul is created. An eternal being. That individual will live forever somewhere in a body. That's what's promised in the Word when we talk about the resurrection and so forth. Okay, now, turn with me if you have your Bibles. Turn with me to the, the Psalm 139. We're going to look at a couple passages of Scripture this morning. <clears throat> and we, we really uh, want to go to verse 13, but we're going to read down to it. This is a psalm of David. It says this. O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. Do, do you realize how much God knows about you? Everything. Everything. That's, that's scary. Now the word tells us when we get saved, the stuff before salvation, he throws in the sea of his forgetfulness. He, he doesn't bring that up anymore. But from the time of knowing Jesus and onward, everything is recorded. It says, it says that Every word of our mouth, he hears, okay? And he'll hold us accountable as believers. Just, I'm, I'm reading up to 13. He says you, it says, you can pass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, you know it altogether. You've beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain to it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell or the grave, you're there. There's no place we can go to get away from God. There's no hole in the ground deep enough that we can get away from God. He's everywhere. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hides not from thee, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike. God knows everything. He sees everything. He knows where we are, where we were, where we're going. He knows what we're thinking and what we're not thinking. He knows the intents of our heart. He knows our agendas. And he says this, For you have possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. You've covered me 
in my mother's womb. When we were that little microscopic speck inside of our mother's womb, God knew us. He knew what our name would be. And I'll take it even a step further. He knew us before that. There's no accident. There's nobody that was ever born that God said, what happened? He says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, King David, he didn't understand genetics. They didn't have the science of human reproduction. They, he could not talk about chromosomes and, and DNA and traits from mom. He just knew this. That it would take a mighty God to create a human being. It would take a mighty God to construct a being in his image. Because the Bible says we were formed in his image. Just like him. I thank God for animals and all the plant life and animal life we have. But not a single one of them was created in his image. Only mankind. Only man. He says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. Look what he says. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret. God knew. When you were formed, when David was formed in his mother's womb, when, God, when you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew who you were. And every, every one of the seven billion individuals on this earth today, all different, all separate, all with their own specific, distinct DNA fingerprint, God knows. Every personality, new people, who you are, God knew you when you were that little, that little speck. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curi curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which is in continuance, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He says, you knew me, you formed me, you knew the things I would do right, you knew the things I would do wrong, you, had already, you already knew my life being God, you knew the choices I would make in my life. And you've provided for me, as he has for every one of us. He's a sovereign God, and he knows all things. The one thing he will not do is make you do what you don't want to do. You have a choice. He says how precious are thy thoughts unto me, how great is the sum of them. So we see that King David believed in life and conception. He believed that God knew the little child in the womb. Let's, let's look elsewhere. Uh, turn with me over to the prophet Jeremiah, and this is one I know that many are familiar with. Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 4. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, before I formed you in your mother's womb, you know that, that process where a little child is formed in the mother's womb. I can remember... When I was a little kid, maybe like seven or eight years old, I didn't know about, you know, the facts of life. They, had, they hadn't had that talk with me yet, okay? You know what I'm talking about. And we used to get Life Magazine. How many people remember Life Magazine? We used to get it once a week or once a month, whenever it was. It was a big magazine. I remember one came, and the, and the subject of this one particular month's issue was uh, children. And, and they had... They had uh, discovered ways of taking pictures inside the mother's womb of the fetal development. And I remember as a six or seven-year-old kid, not really understanding, looking at these pictures, and I was like, 
wow. You mean, you mean that's inside the, and I was like, and for a while I was kind of scared. It was like, you know, and I didn't know if I should ask my dad about this or dad. What's, and I'd be looking, and, they, and it, showed, it showed the very beginnings, the microscopic, you know, like the egg, and it showed the very various developments, and it showed the child almost full term that they could take a picture of. And I was looking, I said, wow, is that the way it works? The word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed you, what a mighty God that he would design such a, a miraculous thing to happen, the, the formation of a child. I know some of you, I, I know Sister John and Kathy are expecting a grandbaby coming up here pretty soon. And I know Sister Lori is expecting a grandbaby, and I believe Ashley is expecting a little one coming too, if of her own, coming on the way. God is forming that one. What a, what a mighty God. He says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. If he said that, somebody said, well, that's Jeremiah. He's a great prophet. Well, yeah, that, he had a calling on Jeremiah's life. But listen, if he knew Jeremiah, do you think he did not know you? Before you were formed in your mother's belly, God knew you. He knew you. He says, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I, what, sanctified. It's the sanctity of human. I set you apart, Jeremiah, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Listen, he might not have ordained us as a prophet unto the nations, but he's ordained us to something because there's no accidents. There's no mistakes. God knows everyone okay and we know what jeremiah he went on to be a great prophet turn with me to another passage just just looking at some examples of men turn with me to uh in the new testament to the book of galatians the apostle paul Galatians chapter 1, and let's start at verse 10. The Apostle Paul, we all know that he wrote this letter to the church, churches in Galatia because they were falling away from the faith. They were, they were beginning to, to follow after uh, Judaism and, and different kinds of uh, legalistic teachings, and, and Paul wanted to straighten them out. And he said, in verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul said, listen, I'm not doing this to make you happy. I'm doing this because God called me. He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul was saying, listen, the gospel that we preach, the gospel that we believe in, does not come from the church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. It doesn't come from the assemblies of God. It doesn't come from some man-made organization. It didn't come from the apostles. It didn't come from, from uh, uh, the, uh, the Jews or the Pharisees or the Sadducees. The gospel of Jesus Christ comes from Jesus Christ. Whatever, whatever building you happen to find yourself in, whatever group of folks you happen to find yourself in, that's one thing or another. But the gospel we preach is not the gospel of some man. It's not man-made. Jesus told Peter, he says, Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father in heaven. Paul says, I wasn't taught this. I didn't receive it from men, but I received the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says this, For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul hated the Christians. Because he was, he was a powerful Jewish leader. And when this sect of Christianity rose up, or the followers of that way, they called it, or the followers of Jesus, he hated them. He thought they were trying to, to tear down Judaism. So he uh, pers uh, prosecuted, persecuted the uh, early Christians. He says, I profited in the Jews' religion, in verse 14, above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my father. Paul said, I was good at what I did. But 
then he says in verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. What Paul is saying was, it was God who separated me from my mother's womb. It was God who rose me up. It was God who knew me before I was old enough to even understand anything. And it's God who put me in this place right now. And if you're saved today and you're following Jesus Christ, you can say the same thing. It's God that got you here. You didn't get here because somebody preached a message to you. You didn't get here because you, you know, said a prayer and nodded your head up and down. You got here because of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It might have come through preaching. It might have come through witnessing. It might have come through reading a book or watching a program on TV. But we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by what he did. And all we do is we make the choice to receive his gift. I receive his gift. The Apostle Paul knew that it was God that had him received and separated from his mother's womb. It was God who had called him and chosen him to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. To write two-thirds of the New Testament. To give us the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of salvation. the doctrine, all, Everything we believe really comes from the pen of the Apostle Paul. God knew him. He knew him before he was born. He formed him in his mother's womb. Turn with me again, just one more passage. Way back in Psalm 22. Talked about David, Jeremiah, Paul. But in chapter 22, we read a prophetic psalm. It was written by King David, but it wasn't about King David. Psalm 22 is a psalm that looks to the cross and looks to the blood. Say, I just, I, I just, listen, you need to grab a hold. If you don't remember anything, you need to grab a hold of this this morning. Because God knows the end from the beginning. He knew you would be here this morning. He knows, listen, he knows what you're going through this morning. And you might even be going through something making you think, I wonder if this, if this God thing is real. Listen, Psalm 22. Let's just, I, let's, just read, let's just read from verse 1. There's so much, but I, I just want to read from verse 1. My God, my God, why have you... That sound familiar? Where do you read those words? When Jesus was hanging on the cross. When he was hanging on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachana. They thought he was calling for Elijah. But he wasn't. This psalm is prophetic of Christ on the cross. It's a description, hundreds of years before it happened, of what it was like when Jesus was hanging there. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear not, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. We know that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, things got dark. He says, but you are holy, O you that inhabit the praises of Israel. See, it seemed when Jesus was hanging on that cross that he had been forsaken, but he was never forsaken. He had never lost his relationship with the Father. There was, because sin was placed on him, there was darkness. There was a separation for a time as Jesus bore the sin of mankind, but he never stopped being the eternal Son of God. In his humanity... He felt abandoned. His friends had left him. He was being mocked and scorned and suffering on the cross for, for the things that he had never done. He says in verse 4, Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you did deliver them. They cried unto you and were delivered and trusted in thee and were not confounded. That's one of the things they, they said back to Jesus when he was on the cross. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. And they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. This is all a prediction. This is all a prophecy of what would happen at Calvary. Because this is what happened. As he was hanging there, they mocked him. They said, oh, if you're the Messiah, come down off the cross and save yourself. Or uh, call upon Elijah, maybe he can save you. And they were making a mockery of what he was doing up there on the cross for them.
But he says in verse 9, But you are he that took me out of the womb. We, just a few months ago, we celebrated Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Do we understand the sanctity of life? Jesus validates who we are and what we are by becoming one of us. You see, he was formed in his mother's womb. The miraculous implantation of the divine seed. And he began to grow as a little one cell, then two, then four, then eight, then sixteen. Just like you, just like me. The, all, the, all the processes that would take place inside of his mother, is, those of you ladies who have bore children, you understand what it feels like to bear children. I don't understand what it feels like to bear children. Uh, you know, morning sickness, the whole nine yards. The same thing. He became one of us. And by doing so, he validates and sanctifies our lives and the lives of every baby in every womb it's a it's appalling let's read a little bit more but thou art he that took me out of my uh, out of the womb you did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast I was cast upon thee from the womb thou art my God from my mother's belly how many how many Babies in, in, in the Bible who were born that God knew about them before they ever were even conceived. You can start counting them. Isaac, Samuel, John the Baptist, Moses, Samson. Babies who were announced before and sometimes in circumstances that were impossible. Yet God knows each and every one of us. You know today... Our, our culture, our nation, has turned into a culture of death. It started, it, it, it didn't happen overnight. The Roe v. Wade thing was just another step down. They took the prayer out to school. They said they took God out. They went to take God out of our conscience. Instead of, instead of uh, being illegal to te teach evolution, now it's illegal to teach anything but evolution used to be that way. Now they teach the kids that they're nothing but animals with a, with a good brain. And we see the deterioration of our society, of our culture, going down further and further. It's not Democrats or Republicans. It's turning our back on the God of this Bible. One more passage, and we're going to close. I hope, I hope you're convinced this morning that the life that's inside a mother's womb is, 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 a, is, a, is a living human being from the very beginning. And I want to say this, and please understand me. I, I don't look down my nose at anybody or become, you know, harsh with anybody. There are, there are many women who have allowed themselves to have abortions, who, who have this guilt. And, you know, we need to realize that God is a God of forgiveness. And we need to understand that. And I pray and hope that we as believers, if you're going to be pro-life, you need to work or, uh, toward offering solutions to women that find themselves in that position. It's one thing to say I'm pro-life, but then you don't offer an alternative. Okay? But listen, over in, in, in Romans, just, just read this with me, and it's a passage we've read so many times. But it's a picture of what's happening in our society. Over in chapter 1. And we're going to close with this. I know uh, we don't have to worry about the playoffs. <laughs> okay. Well, some of us don't anyway. So we're not in a hurry to get out. Okay. Some of us do. All right. Look at, look at Romans chapter 1 and 16, and we're closing. We are. The Apostle Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what I think one of the biggest problems is? We have a whole lot of people that's ashamed of the gospel. 
People sitting in churches, people that say they're saved and born again, and they're ashamed to share their faith with anybody. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. We don't have to be afraid of somebody putting us down or making us feel bad or feel little. Listen, I know what God did for me. That's, they can say whatever they want to to me. I'll tell them what God, how God changed my life 27, 28 years ago. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. I don't care who wins the election. It doesn't matter. It's the power of God. The gospel is what's going to change lives and change our society. That can be nothing else. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God, well, you know, we don't want like to think of God as being angry. But God is angry. You ever get angry? Anybody here ever get angry? There's some things that will make you angry. There's a thing called righteous anger. That doesn't give us the right to go blow up buildings, okay? That's the Islam. That's, they do that. We don't do that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How can we deny that that child in the mother's womb is not a life? What, where, where do they get that? When they first did this, uh, this abortion thing, it was like, you know, as long, uh, up until the life is viable, they said. It can exist outside the womb on its own. But what about that little one with a beating heart and brain and eyes and hands and fingers? And they can say that's not life because it can't live outside the mother. They hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. All you got to do is pick up that old copy of that old Life magazine and look at them pictures of that little baby in that mother's womb, and that ought to tell them that there's a God in heaven. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Paul wrote this before they had electron microscopes. Paul wrote this before they had the Hubble telescope and they could look out into the universe. Paul wrote this before they could look inside a woman's body or a man's body and see the organs happening and see the formation of a child. Paul knew this before they had all that stuff. How much more today should we be convinced of the greatness and sovereignty of a mighty God? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We don't have an excuse. Do you know? I was watching one of them, one of them doctor programs on TV. And, and now, you know, you know what they, they have a thing now where if, if a couple wants to have a child, and they want to they be able to choose the genetic uh, propensities of that child. They can actually make four or five embryos and take them out and, and freeze them. And they can check the, the, the DNA and check the, you know, the, the, and, and, the, and the family. I saw this on TV. They could choose. Well, this one has a 90% chance of having blonde hair. And this one has a 90% chance of having blue eyes. And this one, and they can pick and choose which one they want and get, in, and get planted back in. We're sick. It's a sick society. We're playing God. And the ones they don't want to use? But each and every one of them is a person, is a human being. This is where our societies come. Listen. Because of when they knew him, they, this is verse 21, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. That's where our society is right now. If you want to read a road map to destruction, read Romans chapter 1 real good. Because in our culture and in our society, we have, we have exalted 
fame and fortune and money and all these other things, and life just becomes the shedding of blood, just a special effect on the movie screen. Yet every day, every day, children are aborted. Do you realize a whole generation of children have had their future ended? They're with the Lord now. They're individuals. I don't care how far along it, it was. They're, if, they're with the Lord now. I believe that. But we've lost the opportunity to see them grow and flourish and enjoy life. It says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own flesh, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And you can read the rest of chapter 1. And you can get the picture. Listen, this is Sanctity of Life Sunday. I don't know what y'all what your opinions are of on on the abortion issue and and you're entitled to your opinion whatever it is but I'm here to tell you this the bible tells us that the life inside the mother that, that that's a life that's a person and there's so many other places we can look i want to encourage you this morning choose life choose life and, and, and not only that, it's one thing to say you're pro-life, but look, there's a lot of organizations and groups that help, that offer alternatives to young ladies who find themselves with child. You need to pray, prayerfully find one and get involved, either financially or as a volunteer or whatever, because if we're, going to, if we're going to tell people to choose life, we need to give them, we need to support them. See, because it's easy to stand up here and say, choose life. But then when a young girl finds herself with child and there's no, and the father isn't there and, and, and there's no form of uh, provision, we need to pray how the church can rise up, how the body of Christ can rise up and not only be pro-life, but be willing to support and encourage and help those girls in need. It's sort of like James said, and I'm closing, I promise I am. He said, it's one thing, if you, have, if you have stuff and somebody comes to you and they say they have a need and you know you have it and you don't give it to them and you say, well, go ahead and be blessed, go ahead and be warm. Be... That's not the way it ought to be. Amen? I want to ask you this morning, first of all, to prayerfully pray for our nation. I don't know if today is the March, March for Life down there. They're going down today. They usually go down uh, the Sunday closest to, I don't know if, you know, people take buses and go down to Washington, D.C. I don't know where. Pray for our nation. Pray for our judges. Not only the Supreme Court, but the ones in appellate courts and in and, and circuit courts and our federal judges, our local judges. Pray for our judges. You see, they're going to be held responsible. I was reading about that decision back in 1973. It was a 7-2 to decision. Roe v. Wade. I thought, those judges, do they realize? I don't know how many millions it is now of babies who have been aborted, but the blood of those babies is on those judges' hands. And I, I think most of them have probably passed away by now. That was a long time ago. But pray for our judges. Pray for our congressmen. Pray for us. Pray for the, our president. Pray for this election coming up. Pray that God will put people in place because I believe that this, this has been a bane. It's been a curse in our nation. And unless some things get changed, God's hand. Listen, when the ancient Israelites, and he, People say, I thought he said he was going to quit. I am. I, I promise I am. But the ancient, the ancient Israelites, you know, what, you know what, what, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? They were offering their children. They were offering their children as sacrifices to the god Molech. 
We've done that. I want to pray this morning. And here's the thing. God is a forgiving God. God is a forgiving God. There might be those who have been a part of, you know, maybe, maybe you're a woman, maybe you've had an abortion in your life. And there's guilt and there's shame. God's a forgiving God. Maybe you're a man and you helped pay for an abortion one, one time. God's a forgiving God. But help us. Lord, help us in our nation. Get this under the blood of Jesus Christ. If you care and if you love and if you're concerned about what God wants, one person at a time. Amen. Let's stand as we close in prayer. If you, listen, again, I don't know all your lives. I don't know where you've been or what you've done. If you feel that you need forgiveness, and, and again, it's, it's not, you don't have to admit anything or if, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to come up because maybe you wouldn't want to come up. If, if you feel you need forgiveness, listen, God has forgiveness. No matter what we've done, there's forgiveness. There's no sin that's unforgivable other than the sin of unbelief. But if you need forgiveness for that, or really for anything, we're going to pray this morning that God's forgiveness would rest, that you would experience his loving touch wherever you might be. And listen, this week, if you get an opportunity to minister to somebody that's hurting, it might have to do with abortion, it might not. But if you get a chance to minister to somebody, it's like our brother Leo said, if God speaks to you to speak to somebody, don't be afraid. You know, he could have went and talked to that one, and she could have said, get out of my face. But, but listen, you do what God tells you to do. Let's look to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, Father, we stand in your presence, Lord. We thank you that you are a God of life. You give life. You created life. You are life. Father, we live in a nation that has turned its back on you in so many different ways. Father, I pray right now for those within the sound of my voice. Father, if there is one in this room that maybe feels that they have done something that it could never be forgiven for, it might be an abortion, it might be related to something else. Father, you know each and every one of us. Even as it said in Psalm 139, you know our, our down sittings and our uprisings. You know everything about us, Lord. And all you want us to do is to come to you this morning and say, Lord, I know I've done this. I've know, I know I have transgressed your law. I know I have broken your heart. Lord, will you please forgive me? For, by the blood of Jesus Christ, know that you are forgiven. You're forgiven. Forgiveness. It's the power. That's the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins. He took our sins upon himself. And there's no need to live in condemnation because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. So I thank you for my brother's testimony. I pray, Lord, you will help us this week. Be willing to reach out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. In whatever capacity, in whatever, in whatever state they're in. Lord, I pray you would lift us up, Lord, that you would begin to break up the fallow ground. That's our prayer this year, Lord, that hearts would be broken. That, heart, that the hardened hearts would be broken up. That the seed of your word will be planted and take root. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you and we give you glory. Father, for all these things, we thank you, Lord, that you knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. You knew we would be standing in this room here today on January 22nd, 2012. You knew the words that would be spoken, the songs that would be sung. Father, you knew everything that was going to happen. And, and Father, our lives are sanctified by you. God, use us for your glory. If there's a person here that's not saved, I pray, Lord, they wouldn't leave that way. If, the person, if there's a person here who's bearing a burden of unforgiveness or of guilt, I pray, Lord, it would be released right now. Listen, just release it this morning in the name of, for anything. Just release that unforgiveness right now in the name of Jesus. That condemnation, that guilt that Satan is trying to place on you. Give it up to him. Give it up to the Lord right now. It was taken on the cross. The blood of Jesus was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. That's enough. His blood is enough. We don't have to add anything to it. God, forgive us, save us, and equip us to do your will. 
And we thank you and we give you all the glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just worship the Lord this morning. Just take some time and worship him this morning. Hallelujah. Father, you're worthy. You are a worthy God. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning, Father. That we may praise you, Father, in spirit and truth, Lord. That we may offer up prayers, Father, groanings and utterances, Father, that we might pray in the Spirit and give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. That you would break the yoke, Father. That the anointing that would break the yoke in the name of Jesus Christ. Break the yoke, Father. The yoke of unforgiveness, the yoke of guilt, the yoke of condemnation. Break it in the name of Jesus Christ. Set free in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can you give the Lord a hand clap this morning? He's worthy. Hallelujah.